Hello, dear friends, and welcome to Talking Music, the show where you get to enjoy long-form discussions with superb and fascinating musicians. My brilliant guest today is the classical and flamenco guitarist, Grisha Goyrachev. Grisha, welcome to Talking Music. It's my pleasure being here. Thank you, Sam. The pleasure's all mine, my friend. Thank you for being here. Now, Grisha, I think it's fair to say that most people following this channel are familiar with you and your work. But for those who aren't, could you please start by giving us a brief overview of who you are and what's been your journey through life that has led you to be sitting here today? Well, I'm a classical and flamenco guitarist, as you just said, <laughs> but I was born in the Soviet Un Union um, and uh, my father is a guitarist and guitar teacher, so he was always practicing, you know, uh, as a baby, I remember listening to him play, and it was really calming me down, and um, I just could listen for hours. It was a really nice uh, music, very soothing. And uh, that's uh, basically how I started playing the guitar, because I asked my father to teach me. And he started teaching me around probably five or six. And I really liked it. Uh, I played some classical pieces, some etudes. And um, at that time, I, I wasn't sure if that was my destiny or anything. It was just one of the activities that I like to do. And then in 1986, I uh, was able to attend a concert of Paco de Lucia, who came to Soviet Union for the first time. And that completely changed my life. Uh, so I just couldn't believe that uh, such a music could exist anywhere. And uh, I begged my father to teach me how to play that. And he didn't really know uh, much about flamenco. So um, we were able to find a method by Juan Martin um, that is uh, very famous. Um, and uh, I started learning those pieces and the method and all the techniques. And uh, within one year, I was able to play the whole, you know, all the material from the book. And that's what I started performing uh, when uh, finally I started my concert career. So my first concert was, I think, in 1987. So eh, it's been a long time. And uh, then I immigrated to United States in 1995 and attended conservatory here, uh, New England Conservatory where I studied with Elliot Fisk, and I studied classical guitar. So I got my bachelor's, master's, and doctor of musical arts degrees in classical guitar. And um, then kind of my concert career really ramped up, and um, now I'm playing everywhere. Well, that's a wonderfully succinct way of describing your musical journey. And... I'd just like to talk about a few things related to that, because there's so much you've talked about there that we could go into in more detail. I wanted to ask a question, because I've heard a bit of a rumor, Grisha. Is it true that you spent time with the great Paco de Lucia um, during your early early development? Uh, well, I spent just a uh, couple of hours with Paco de Lucia, really. Um, I was invited to play at his house in Madrid, uh, in 1994, when I was uh, in Spain, just giving some concerts, so that was um, that was the only time that I really spent, you know, with Paco de a quality time, where I played for him and we spoke and everything. And uh, I also saw him, you know, after his concerts, but that wasn't as uh, <laughs> as good a time as uh, as I had when when I played for him. Like that was probably my my biggest dream in my life. So, yeah, but I never studied with Paco de Lucia. He was just kind of my mentor in, in everything. I mean, he was my biggest hero. Um, but uh, yeah, I, he never taught me anything <laughs> personally. That makes a lot of sense. What an amazing experience. And 
I'd like to ask a follow-up question in relation to that, because it struck me as you were talking that during your development, you've met and interacted with some really phenomenal musicians. You mentioned the great Elliot Fisk in the classical world, and we've just talked about the great Paco de Lucia in the flamenco world. Could you please share with us some of your favorite memories of some of these encounters with these great players? Well, I had uh, so many encounters and uh, kind of, it's impossible to talk about all of them, but one of the recent encounter was with uh, Leo Brower, who came to um, to Boston for Boston Guitar Fest. And uh, I kind of elected to uh, show him around and uh, drive him around a little bit. So we spoke a lot and I played, you know, played a concert and he attended and uh, we were talking about all sorts of things and especially composition. So I was able to play some of my uh, falsettas for him. And uh, he gave me some advices and he told me about um, not composing pieces, but rather technical exercises. So, so that you never really finish anything, but you keep developing. So he said, that's, that's a very good way of composing. So that was a memorable experience. And also I met Andrew York not so, not so long ago. So I spoke to him about composition and uh, what a wonderful guy he is <laughs> and so interesting to talk to. So this, this sort of experiences and, uh, then, uh, um, I think in 19, no, in 2006 or was it five, some, some, sometime in the mid two thousands, I also was able to meet Tamatito in Almeria and uh, I spent a lot of time playing for him and he played for me some of his pieces that he was working on and uh, it was just some of the best experience of my life and um, it was interesting that he was really interested in my uh, technique so as I was playing I remember Monasterio de Sal and I was in a very good shape so you know all the scales were really working out he, he got really close to my right hand and he was just watching it as I was playing that picado run <laughs> It was very interesting because uh, I, I didn't think that he would be um, into into technique that much, but apparently he was, and it was just a great experience. He was very, very nice, nice person. I'd be curious to know, he was very interested in your technique. What was, what was the thing that you found most interesting about hearing Tomatito play in the same room as you? Uh, really good sound and um, powerful. And he sounded to me even better than on his recordings playing in person. So I was very, very impressed with his mastery. Um, he is a real deal for sure. Yeah. And, uh, I also met his, uh, his young son when, uh, um, Jose de Tomate, right? That's his name. So he was, uh, studying with, with his father when I came in and, um, he was looking at me kind of, uh, I, I could see that he, he was kind of sizing me up and seeing what, what I was all about. So he, he was skeptical. I could see that. <laughs> They're amazing stories, Grisha. Thank you for sharing them with us. And I, I've got to ask a little follow-up if I may. Sure. Is there anyone, either a legend who's still with us or someone who isn't that you would like to meet if you could? Well, there are a lot of people that I didn't meet before they passed uh, passed away. So, for example, Sabikas is probably the one that I, I really lament not ever seeing. But um, in terms of um, living legends, I'd really like to meet Paco Sepero, and I really want to meet Rikini. I never really met Rafael Rikini. Um, and of course, in classical world, it was Andres Segovia that I never, never got a chance to see uh, live or, or meet. Um, I did, um, I did meet uh, Julian Bream and uh, John Williams. So that's good. That's a good list. That's a very good list indeed. 
I'd like to drill into one aspect of what you just mentioned there, because you mentioned Sabikas. And I think for a lot of people watching, some of the first things I'll have seen of you perform are some of your wonderful recordings on YouTube of you playing Sabikas's music. And I believe your first album was all Sabikas repertoire. What is it about Sabikas's music that really grabbed you? Because clearly, even as a young musician, that was a real interest for you as a player. I think it was um, the energy that he, he puts into his uh, playing. It was the clarity, the power, the assertiveness. And uh, of course, monster, monster technique. That was uh, just amazing hearing hearing him play. Um, I, I just listened to his playing for hours and hours on end. I had tape player um, that, you know, I had to flip to the other side. So all, all my all my tapes were just uh, so worn out <laughs> from me just uh, play, playing on repeat. Um, yeah, it was it was the energy and uh, he was my first, you know, hero in flamenco. Um, at that time, I just couldn't understand uh, Paco de Lucia's music as as well as Sabika's music. Sabika's was just easier to grasp for me and i i was just marveling at uh, you know his his power and um, and clarity like everything was just absolutely beautiful yeah and it was later that i got into paco de lucia's uh, music and uh, the older i get the more i understand it right i understand exactly what you're saying there this kind of leads me to what I would like to talk to you about next, because one thing that struck me over the years, we've known each other, Grisha. How can I put this? You've had such a diversity of different experiences on your musical journey in terms of the musicians you've met and interacted with and been inspired by, like we've just talked about, in terms of the music you've chosen to study and specialize in, like we talked about earlier, and even in terms of the the venues you've performed in and the performance settings you've been in. I imagine you can't have that sort of diversity of experience without learning a lot of valuable lessons along the way that shape you into the person you are. So let me ask you this. If you had to pin it down to one thing, what would you say is the most valuable lesson you've learnt as a musician to date? Well, the most valuable lesson is patience. You have to be patient and uh, you have to be um, no I guess it's perseverance right so you just you have to keep keep at it keep improving but there are other lessons that are very valuable as well for example to stay humble and uh, also to not compare yourself to others too much because that leads to all sorts of problems um, and also self so openness to self-discovery and to trying out different ways of playing of thinking so that is very important for the growth of uh, of any musician so really also staying honest to yourself because there are all these other ways that you can be, that you can play, that you can imitate. But it's most important to find your own voice and your own way of, of expressing, right? And it doesn't matter even if, if you play your own music, which of course is better in, in flamenco if you play your own music and you should compose. But even if you play other people's um, music, uh, and maybe other composers in classical music, still, it's your own expression. You can't imitate anybody else without losing who you are. There's some really wise words there. Thank you for sharing them with us. I'm going to do something now, Grisha, that I, I often like to do when I get guests on the show. I'm going to embarrass you a little bit by offering <laughs> you some compliments. Oh, 
I've I thought this through. The the reason I want to do this is you have many attributes as a person that I think anyone watching this or listening to this, irrespective of their musical background, their level of ability, or even the music they specialize in, they could learn valuable lessons from. So let me start with this. And you kind of echoed it a moment ago. Motivation. One thing that always astonishes me, well, I wouldn't say astonishes, but more inspires, is how someone like yourself who's achieved so much on the guitar can still be so motivated to keep pushing forward. What gives you that motivation, Grisha? Where does it come from? The motivation is um, self-discovery. I want to know everything about myself and i also want to know how far i can take it and it's not like you know i achieved the level and now there is nothing nothing there every time you move a little bit higher you see more more ways to grow so right now i i, I still feel feel like i'm in the middle of the sea of knowledge and like i i don't know i could i could swim in any direction and um and grow in pretty much anything, everything. So expression, technique, uh, understanding of, of, of music, um, composition, everything. So it's basically finding out how, how far I can, I can take it. And of course, it's nothing without love. I mean, if I didn't love it, um, probably I wouldn't want to proceed, but I love it so much and um, practicing and working on, on, on these things, sometimes I don't even notice time, you know, when, when I do it. Uh, it's very, very pleasurable for me to do and very interesting. And it's my favorite passage of time, basically playing the guitar and just uh, even, even noodling or improvising however you want to call it, maybe composing, just playing for myself. I, I keep telling stories through my, through my playing to myself. And I, I learn every time I learn like a chord that I, I never, never knew existed before, or it's a melody or some embellishment that just came out nice, nicely. And that's something that's very interesting to me. And there, there are so many things to learn. So that's what keeps me motivating is because I don't know these things. So, and the, the more I listen to other musicians, other music, the more I see that I'm lacking in certain, certain, certain aspects, um, maybe not even lacking, but I never noticed that it was possible to express something that way. And it's interesting for me to try it out and, and, and see if it fits my, my, my character, my style. And where could I use it? So yeah, maybe I, I won't get any faster than than I am now, which I'm okay with. But um, in terms of expression, definitely, <laughs> there's so much to learn. I think that's a wonderful answer. And I'm just going to tease out a few things that you, you mentioned there, if I may, because I liked how it echoed something I think a lot of people watching and listening can relate to, that I think when we're younger musicians, we think of achieving something in music, and I, I mean achieving in an artistic sense rather than a, a financial or a, a career sense. We often think of it as kind of a, a point on the map that you arrive at, and at that point you'll be satisfied. But I think you put it beautifully in that it's more of a journey and as with any great journey that's a lifelong process, you might arrive at a particular destination, but you're then wanting to see what's over the next hill. And it's your curiosity and love for the journey that keep pushing you forward in that respect. And it's something that we all kind of know deep down, but we don't really hear it articulated forthrightly and eloquently normally. So thank you for expressing it in that way. That was beautiful to hear. You're welcome. Yeah, uh, the journey never stops, really, as long as you love it, as long as you are capable physically of, of doing it, you will learn something new. 
and uh, yeah, it's it's a never never ending journey. So that's what makes music so beautiful is because it's it's limitless. This leads me really nicely to the next compliment I'd like to give you. I'm always astonished at your work ethic. You, you're one of the hardest working people I know when it comes to music. And having a strong work ethic is important for all musicians. You can't, you, the practice isn't going to do itself. You're not going to grow unless you make it happen. So I think you're in a good position to answer this. Could you describe for me what an average practice day might look like for you? And based on this, what advice would you give to our listeners who want to make the best use of their own practice time? All right. Well, I think it's important to understand what you're practicing for. And to understand that, it's either you need to have a concrete goal, like a performance, for example, or you need to understand what you're lacking. So if you're lacking something, then you create a schedule for yourself to attack that specifically so that it's, um, it's, yeah, so all your time is spent um, making, making better that thing that you, you think you're, you're lacking. So improving. Uh, but for me, for example, right now, I'm preparing for a series of concerts, I'm going to Greece, for example, and then Croatia. And um, for that, I my, my day is like this, I spend about four hours of um, technical so playing technical exercises so all the scales arpeggios uh, rosgiados al sapuo pulgar uh, left hand uh, stretches uh, slurs and so on so it takes about four hours depending on what uh, what i do so i have several sets of those exercises and then i take my program which is about an hour and 20 minutes if i just play it through with no, no stopping and I played at about um, anywhere from 40 to 110% uh, of the speed. So so sometimes it's just 40%. So if it's, uh, you know, hour and 20 minutes, then you can you understand that it's a long, <laughs> long journey. So you just keep, keep playing and playing. Um, and then um, at the end, I also choose a piece that was less than than perfect maybe that i felt there was something that i i would like to improve and i just improved that and uh, then at night when i'm really really tired i just play for myself i play whatever comes to my mind i don't play any you know any pieces that i i already learned i just improvise i do that all the time you know just even tuning the guitar sometimes when i tune i i go into different harmonies and those harmonies um you know open up like doors for me musically to to maybe create uh, like a falsetto or something so so that's that's what my my day uh, looks like uh, right now so i i have that technical exercise first and then uh, repertoire slowly or sometimes not slowly sometimes it's at you know the same speed or even 10% faster than than I have to play on stage. And uh, plus, uh, wor working on the composition, you know, one of the pieces and uh, improvising for myself. So that's that's what I do. And that's now. But if I have to learn some music, for example, then it's different Then I, I learn it for like five hours a day and maybe do some technical exercises because without those um, it's easy to um, it's easy to lose some of the technique that you you need and really technique is there to serve what whatever you want to express so maybe it's enough to play what you are composing but if you're also thinking that maybe in a in a month I'll ha I'll have a performance that I need to be ready for so you you still need that technique to be there when you need it I'd like to drill into some of those areas you've talked about, if I may. Sure. So one thing that struck me as being very interesting, and I'd like to unpack it a bit, you talked about when you 
practice repertoire, you'll often play it slower than you intend to, and then anything up to 100% and then just beyond it. So you said, I think it was 110 was the specific yeah. reference you gave. Would I presume that's, because we've all done this on stage where the adrenaline's pumping, we're all fired up and we come in a bit quicker than we probably should and suddenly realize this isn't gonna work. Yeah. And unless you've practiced that, that can be a major problem. So I'm assuming that's probably what the reason is there. Am I right? Well, some of it, yes. I mean, I do want to have a res reserve of uh, technique when I play on stage, especially for some of the, you know, scales and, and things like that, you know, difficult arpeggios. But it's not only that. I noticed that if I play, let's say, um, pieces at tempo, you know, because I, I always have the metronome mark for all of my pieces that I play in concerts so that's how i pr practice them with the metronome so if i practice them uh, with the metronome just before i go on stage and then um you know play them on stage at that same tempo it feels like i'm lacking technique when i go on stage because the mind has to share you know just concentrating that concentration on on the performance with stage fright with the new you know um, surroundings with different noises coming coming in you know so your your processing power is over task right um, and that's why I want to be able to have that reserve of processing power basically my brain power when I when I go on stage and uh, the last, um, let's say, four concerts, I tested it out, and uh, it really worked like a charm. So, as a, uh, for example, I, I play impetu at about 150 BPM, and uh, I would be practicing it uh, at like 175 just before I go on stage. So, and then when I go on stage, I feel like I've already accomplished something. I'm already in that um, mode where my mind is rushing. Because you have to, you have to really think uh, <laughs> very fast to to be able to play it that um, that fast. So as I play it at its normal tempo, it feels like just like what I was doing, you know, uh, in a practice room. So does that make sense? That makes a lot of sense. And I noticed in your answer, technique was a very heavy feature of what you're practicing. Is that always the case? And if so, why, why is that the central focus of what you do most days? Uh, well, because I want to express more, right? So if if I'm lacking in technique, let's say if I don't practice technique, I'm still able to play these pieces, but maybe I don't have the same reserve, and then um, maybe I have to think about my fingers a little bit more than I that I should. So so yeah, that's that's it. So I, I have to think about my my fingers too much. So because because of that, um, I I want to make my technical abilities uh, you know so so great that I don't have to think about them so that I can just concentrate on music. So, um, yeah, so all my attention is then uh, on nuances. That makes sense. So there's, it's, it facilitates you to have less barriers between the sound that's in here and here and what comes out through the sound hole of the guitar. Exactly. That's, that's, that's a wonderful way of putting it. So based on what we've just talked about there, Grisha, what advice would you give to guitarists watching this that want to make the most of their practice time? Let, let's let's give a hypothetical example. Um, often I'll have musicians who will come to me and they'll say, I really want to make the most of my practice time, but I don't have hours and hours every day to work on things. I've maybe got 20 minutes here or half an hour there. How would you advise them to make use of that time in an effective way? Well, in an effective way, uh, I think you need to have some repertoire that you that you play. So variety of 
challenges. So w that's what repertoire is. It it presents a variety of challenges, you know, musical, technical, and expressive, everything. Um, and then, so it would be half and half, maybe half technique, 20 minutes technique, and 20 minutes of um, of repertoire. But however, I have to say that uh, 40 minutes a day is not, you know, is not enough. And you, you have to uh, spend at least, you know, two or three hours every day if you want to grow as a, as a guitarist. Maybe not at the beginning because anything will, will um, you know, m make an improvement. But, you know, life is so short. So if you, if you really love it, uh, then spend at least two or three hours a day. You know, I probably, when I, when I practice now, I spend about eight, you know, nine hours a day practicing. You know playing playing this thing so so it's it's important <laughs> that's really good advice and one more question related to all that i think one thing i often find when i speak to students is they often struggle to keep a level of highly concentrated focus when they're practicing for long periods of time do you find that when you practice do you tend to do 20 minute chunks, have a break, or are you able to keep going and keep that level of focus? Yeah, I can um, keep my focus for about an uh, hour and a half, hour and a half or two hours. And then I kind of have to stand up. The focus is not a problem. The problem is sitting down with guitar. So you have to stand up and kind of uh, stretch a little bit. Otherwise, you're going to have uh, health problems. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I would say that concentration is not a problem. Sometimes um, when I'm transcribing something from recordings, you know, I can just, I can do it for like four or five hours straight, no break, just because it's interesting. And I don't know if you saw my live stream, uh, it was like April 1st last year, I was playing for about five hours, you know, on, online. So I, I'm definitely able to to do that. But I wouldn't recommend, um, you know, doing more than more than an hour. I think it would be much better to to spread your practice into you know several sections sessions of maybe one hour each or even half an hour. I mean, for me, it works better to do a longer se session because it's harder for me to start something. You know, once I'm at it, I, I can just keep going. It's the same same way um, when I take a drive, for example, if I have to drive long distance, I don't like uh, stopping and you know frequently. I just maybe stop one time for gas and you know it's eight hours of driving. Otherwise, yeah. So it's it's the same thing with my with my practice. But I think um, if if you don't have that ability, I would say um, do several sessions of maybe one hour each that would, that would be the best that's very good advice grisha thank you for sharing it we've talked a lot about the practicalities of playing the guitar in what we've just spoken about i'd like to now pivot to a more philosophical area of the discussion i like to ask this question to all my guests because it's a great way to get a sense of their for want of a better phrase, their wider philosophy on music. I think it's fair to say anyone who's ever picked up an instrument has at some point aspired, well, at least I hope they have, to be a good musician. But to achieve something, you kind of have to define it. So let me ask you, Grisha, what does it mean to you to be a good musician? What does it mean to me is to express what I want to express. And first, you need uh, to know what kind of music you want to play. So if you want to play Bach, you know, that's one thing. If you want to play, um, you know, flamenco music by Paco or your own compositions, it's another thing. You know, if you want to play uh, something like um, transcriptions of Stravinsky, you know, that's 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 totally different thing. So and then you have to know what is what what is going to call for, right? 
So not only technically, what are the technical demands, demands, but what, how do you want to sound? Like what, what is the scope of your tone colors? What, uh, what is the scope of your dynamics? What about vibrato? What about, um, you know, polyphony? Um, so, vo you know, all the articulations when, when you have different uh, voices going on at the same time, how much control? So, and what do you want to say ultimately? Like, what, what is it about when you play any piece of music? What is the story behind it? And uh, are you able to express it uh, just the way that you want? And if you are able to express it, then you are a good musician. And if you feel that um, you know you know what you want, but you can't can't quite get it, then maybe you have to you have to learn some more. And guess which stage I'm at? Still learning, still learning. So for me, it's it's all about personal journey, really. Um, you know, the close it's the closest that you want to get, uh, the, the closest that you can get to your to your goal. But really, it's it's expressing what you want. I mean, that's that's being a good musician. But also. I guess there is an ability to uh, move the others, move the audience. I mean, uh, so that you you don't only move yourself, which is actually a, a very important part is to move yourself, to have your own um, reaction to to your to your playing. But also, you you need to transmit, you know, this um, to to the to the audience and uh, engage them. So it's a difficult question. And you know what? There are so many opinions about, you know, musicians. You know, I even see some people that are criticizing Paco de Lucia that, you know, they, they think that he was not a good musician or guitarist or his compositions weren't weren't as good. And others think like that he was a god of flamenco, you know, and uh, how how can it be such a wide variety of opinions? So it's it's all very personal, right? But ultimately, I think it's it's about yourself. It's about your journey. You know what you want to express as an artist, and actually, you'd better know. I mean, that's a very important uh, thing: is to discover yourself and to ask yourself these questions. It's like, what am I about? What what is what am I bringing to the table? Like, what's what's different about my performance? And uh, if you are able to um, do it physically, you know, so that's that's being a good musician is to understand the work of music and to be able to um, to be able to execute it. That's a wonderfully insightful and succinct answer. Hmm. As we're on the subject of musicianship, I'd like to talk about some aspects of yours that. I feel don't get as much attention as they probably deserve. I think like most people watching and listening to this discussion, I've watched a great many of your, your performances. I've not had the privilege of seeing you live in person yet. I hope to one day. But I've watched a huge number of your recordings on YouTube of live concerts. And I think the thing that initially hits people about your playing is your incredible technical command of the guitar. It's astonishing that a human being can make such a good sound with their technique when they're playing. And it's wonderful that so many people have recognized this in your playing, but I think it's also blinded a lot of people to other aspects of your musicianship that are, how can I put this? They're equally impressive, but less visually obvious, if that makes sense. So I'm just going to ask you about two of them now. Whenever I see you perform, Grisha, you play with such a depth of emotion. And you're also able to elicit such a wide range of tone colour from the guitar. Let's talk about these subjects. 
let's start with this maybe. Are these things that you consciously think about and work on when you're practicing? Or do they tend to just to come out in the moment when you're performing? Well, I don't work on them in relation to the pieces themselves. But when I was younger, um, I was listening a lot to, you know, classical music. Well, I still listen to it, of course, but um, I remember specifically listening to Segovia recordings because that's what my father had. And he was pointing at his um, tone colors because Segovia was known for that. You know, he had that Ponticello and that Tasto, just really, really great. And my father always told me that, you know, that's what you have to get you know that's what you that's how how to play the guitar that's the most important aspect is your tone and he was never impressed for example if if i if i um was had had a fast day let's say but my nails were rough he was never impressed with that so it needed to be good sound and and also clean technique and everything so i've always been fascinated with uh tone colors but unfortunately when I was younger, I didn't have good nails, so my natural nails are really, really bad. And then when I uh, recorded my first album, that's when I started um, using uh, fake nails. So I used uh, first acrylic powder with glue, and then I switched to these guitar player nails, uh, plastic um, material that I buy at that store, online store. <laughs> and as soon as I um, started using these, I discovered just how much um, I can do with, with with my knowledge of how to produce sound, even with bad nail, like how much I can do with these these nails that are much stronger. And I kind of became obsessed with that. And you know, I've always worked on my on my sound. Like if if I go to my childhood, you know, writings like planners for the day, I always see like okay, work on sound one hour. So, so, so something like that um but now with these nails i mean sky is the limit and i really worked on that on on just the ability to produce different tones um and now with that knowledge it's easy to implement in any piece that i'm playing and by the way i'm not really working on the interpretation of a piece uh, in terms of, I don't create a roadmap for myself. I leave it up to, you know, the performance. So that on the performance day, it's whatever I want. It's the tempo that I want to take it at. And it's the dynamics that come to me at the moment. But with that ability to create, to, you know, produce those tone colors, it all, all works out. But also sometimes I do work on expression. So I like listening to other uh, musicians, other guitarists, and specifically uh, Vicente Amigo. You know, he's very, very expressive. And I do try to um, to understand how he does certain things. So I would just take a passage and keep playing it until I get the, just the right dynamic, you know, that that sounds like, like him. You know how he, he implements those uh rest stroke arpeggio sometimes and it's it's really it produces um an expression that you you never hear in any other flamenco guitar so it's it's these these sort of things that i i'm still working on from time to time but i think that i i know i have a pretty wide palette of you know available things that i can do so i don't need to um to work on my pieces like that but when i practice them slowly um it's like um it's like a child in a candy store you know so uh, so I, I i get to do everything that i want because the tempo is slow and uh i have total control and that's where i go overboard with this you now really really tasked and really ponticello and everything in between and also dynamics it's a wonderful answer to that question, Grisha. Thank you so much. It actually leads me very nicely to where I'd like to go next, because you've talked a lot about listening. 
Those who watch these discussions that I've done previously will know that I often say that from a health point of view, you are what you eat. And in a musical sense, you often are what you listen to. Mm -hmm. So with this in mind, I'd like to pivot to listening and talk about a few aspects of listening and your own musicianship. Mm -hmm. Let me start with this. Who would you say are the guitarists that have most inspired you? And why have they inspired you so much? Well, I guess the first guitarist that inspired me was my father, you know, and because of that, I associate with the sound, so the sound of, of guitar with, um, with love, you know, and uh, just cal calm, so calm spirit, I don't know, something like that. Um, so just listening to him play, I think, shaped my, my musicianship. Um, that was very, very, very important for my development. And then, of course, Andres Segovia, when I listened to his recordings, um, learned a lot about musicianship and uh, expression, tone colors, right? The importance of all those things. Then I listened to uh, Sabikas a lot, as, as I said, and um, just his power and delivery and um, that assertiveness, assertiveness, always, always there. And he never ceased to inspire and amaze me. So I, I never, never was tired of listening to him. All my childhood was spent listening to, to his music. Then, of course, it was Paco de Lucia, which just was my hero. I mean, you can't do better than that. It's, it's uh, incredible what, what he was able to, to achieve in his life and all his recordings are so different. So, yeah, if you get to choose one flamenco guitarist, it has to be Paco de Lucia because there's everything there. There's tradition, there's innovation, there's just um, everything. It's like the old philosopher and the young um, um, and, and that youthful spirit, you know, when he was younger, everything. Um, so Paco de Lucia, of course, was and still is my biggest hero. Then um, I think very, very important was Elliot Fisk. When I uh, started studying with him, he opened up my eyes on the, on the expression and especially, especially um, on just letting go. You know, it's, it's very difficult. Like for me, it was very difficult to to let let myself go and have um have my musicality come come out because i was kind of suppressing it as i, I was um i was very shy when i was younger so he basically let me go and he he opened me up and uh for that i'm forever grateful to him and uh so those those are the the guitars that really influenced me. And then uh, when I first heard Rafael Riqueni, his music, that struck me like it it was it, it was an amazing discovery for me, and um, still is like one of my favorite composers ever uh, in flamenco. Probably one of two favorite Paco and him for me, and uh, Vicente Amigo. Uh, when I uh, heard his first two albums, I was I was really impressed, you know, with him. But um, I think when I heard his third album, which was um, Ciudad de las Ideas, um, like the expression that he was able to um, that that he was able to play with, uh, I, I guess. I've never heard anything like it. You know, that Solia Cordoba, I think that's what it's called on that album. That that's the only solo piece. Um, especially the the ending of it. I, I still don't know how he played it so beautifully. It just it's it's the pinnacle of expression for me. So really, really inspirational. And his uh, music also inspired my own improvisations and uh compositions, uh for sure especially his ornamentation. There's some very fine choices there indeed. 
and I liked how you have very specific reasons for liking each one that are actually quite different in many respects. I do wonder if there's a unifying force that links them all together. I, I suppose what I'm trying to ask is this. When you're listening to other musicians, Grisha, what are you listening for? Yeah, that's a good question, actually. Very good question. I think it changes. Um, and it also changes day to day. Um, when I was younger, what impressed me the most was technique, technical aspects. So speed, clarity, power, uh, precision, and, uh, you know, all that. So that's why I liked, like, really early Paco de Lucia a lot. So I, I really thought that there was, like, the best of that, that you know you can you could ever do and sabikas for that reason also because he was very clear and very clean uh and powerful and and fast but as i grew older for example when i first heard uh lucia album of paco i didn't really understand it as much um because paco really never never went that that fast you know in that in that album as as he did before and it wasn't as flashy i guess uh so i was i was a little bit taking it back you know like what was going on here and but then <laughs> yeah i really realized it is probably the pinnacle of his um his creative journey of his musicianship so now uh, when i um when I listen to to Paco, well, when I listen to to people, um, I listen for expression. So that's the most important thing for me is uh, how they're able to express. Um, so the nuances, um, the tiny shades of um, musicality, the dynamics, uh, not not so much tone colors, but um, the rhythm you know like like phrasing and also just a long-term story that's what i'm listening for uh, also in flamenco what i listen for is um well first the rhythm so so like um the compass um remates and all that because sometimes it's very interesting and very fresh so i naturally want to understand analyze and copy some of that and also the the harmonies and you know how, how how do you harmonize a melody for example i really like listening to cante with different accompanists because uh some of these cantaores uh, they um sing the same letras but um, the the guitar does a absolutely different thing and it all fits so i want to know the most about that so really when when it comes to guitar I do listen to to technique also, of course. I mean that that's kind of amazing, and uh, now is the time to listen for that because the level is just uh, sky high now, and it just keeps keeps going. But mostly, what um, what rocks my boat is <laughs> the the expression. So that's that's what I want to uh, know the m most about. So expression. Based on what you've just talked about there, and in your previous answer, Grisha, it's quite a difficult question to answer this one, because choosing what to leave off the list is often more difficult than knowing what to put on it. But I'd like our listeners to come away from this part of the discussion with some material to go and check out, with your thoughts fresh in their mind. So, with this in mind, could you try to name your top five guitar albums? And why is it that you think they're so important and good? Oh, man. <laughs> Sorry. That's a difficult one. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a difficult one. So I would probably say any album of Sabika's, you know, there needs to be at least one. Um, so you need to know who Sabikas is, and maybe the two albums that come to mind, so you choose one, whatever, is El Rey del Flamenco and Flamenco Puro. 
I think those those two are really really good. So that's one, right? Then let's do Paco de Lucia. For me, Fuente Caudal is probably an album that stands out. Not only does it has Entre dos Aguas, I mean that the most well known rumba of his, but he has Sepa Andalusa, he has Fuente Caudal that Tarantas, um, he has uh, that Fandango that is absolutely beautiful, Granadina, Reflejo de Luna. Uh, so every single piece there. And why do I think that this album is great? First of all, Paco de Lucia is an absolute monster there. Like, um, the, he is, his technique is just unparalleled. But also, I feel that um, that's the end of his traditional period. So at that point, he was still playing traditional flamenco, and he pushed it to the, to the max, to the limit. Like it's the best that he could he could do with that. That was before he started experimenting with jazz and you know all the different influences that came later. It's purely a guitar album, well, except for Entre dos Aguas, with some palmas and jaleos, you know. So that's that's a great great album for that period. Like that's the old Paco, and to me, um, that spirit that Paco still had, spirit of exploration and uh, that. Um, unlimited, absolutely unlimited technique because he was so young and he was at his best, at his peak. And um, another album of Paco's, and that's three, uh, is Lucia. That's the, to me, is the most mature uh, work of his. I mean, there is Casitas Buenas, of course, and um, and other albums that came later, but to me, Lucia is more serious. It's kind of like uh, what Sirocco and Ziryab, uh, where they, they were leading to. So that's probably the best, comp in terms of composition, the best album that Paco ever had. And that Rondeño at the end is, is just mind-boggling. It's, it's, it's just crazy. <laughs> okay, and speaking of composition, I think Rafael Riqueni's uh, album from 1987, I think, called Flamenco, yeah. is incredible. I think recorded he recorded it in, in a church and uh, with natural acoustics and everything. And it's just purely a guitar album. So it's half traditional and half super experimental. So um, Rafael Riqueni is a tremendous ability to compose just his musicianship is um out of this world and that album is just pure gold like every single piece on that album is uh, is a masterpiece and also he has uh some really interesting uh forms in there like sigiria he plays and who plays sigiria solo a solo guitar now no nobody and rumba which is also a solo so it's 10 pieces of just pure genius. And it's all solo. There is nothing, nothing else. No palmas, nothing. It's just him and his uh, foot tapping. Uh, so that's four. I think the list is going to have to be longer. So I think for Vicente Amigo, is a very, very important artist for me. Um, is uh, his first uh, first album called De Mi Corazon al Aire. Um, I think is just so fresh and there's nobody who expresses as much as, uh, well, as uniquely as Vicente Amigo. I think it's like one of the most expressive albums and his playing there is very, very honest. I mean, there were some other albums that were overproduced, you know, um, and it's beautiful, it's so beautiful, but the first album is so honest, and it's just, every single form that he interprets is his, in his own way. It's so unique, so fresh. So, how many is that already? I think you're, in terms of albums, I think you've picked about eight. Um, in terms of artists, I think that's four or five now. Uh, okay. Well, how about how about a couple of more? I think Tauromagia by Manolo Sanlúcar is um, 
just monument, monumental work uh, in everything, in composition and uh, orchestration um, and musicianship of everybody involved. And in terms of the telling of the story, it really tells the story of the day of a bullfight. And to me, that's some some of the best music ever ever composed uh, and and also played. Uh, Manolo Sanuka has such a unique style, and he is so good at at guitar, really. Um, and probably, if you want to know how to write a duet, I think you should uh, listen to to this album because that's really really good. How how the accompanying guitar is blending with Manolo. And um, just one more, right? So if we are talking about monster technique albums, right? So I think Gerardo Nunez Hucal is the one. I don't know how you can beat that. Like in terms of technique, it's it's just perfection, like clarity. And, uh, you know, for me, I, I play some of these pieces and I know how hard they are. It's It's really impossible to do. <laughs> But Gerardo, being such a such an incredible guitarist, he is able, able able to pull it off, and it sounds really really good. I really like that a title piece, that first uh, Bulerias, Hucal. Um, it's in um, E flat, Phrygian, so really 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 fresh. There's some fantastic choices there, Grisha. Thank you for sharing them with us. And I'm hoping that gives everyone watching and listening some wonderful things, if they haven't checked them out already, to go and do. I'd like to stay with our subject of listening just for a little bit longer, because we've mainly focused in the flamenco world so far, mostly. And I think it's fair to say that most people know you for your flamenco performances. But I know from our private conversations, you actually have quite eclectic taste in music. And with this in mind, I'd like to just tease that out a little bit. Other than flamenco, what music do you enjoy listening to and how has this influenced you? Well, the one style obviously is uh, classical, classical music. And um, classical music is really not a style even, you know, it's... It's an umbrella of different styles, and it's so vast, really. So I like listening to symphony orchestras and um, just pick out those um, orchestration, you know, colors to influence my my own music. You know, when when I when I perform something, if I perform a classical work, I kind of need to imagine the orchestra with its um, wa wide variety of possible colors. So, really like listening to voice. So, opera or just songs, you know, because to me that's the that's the most expressive, most expressive instrument. So when we when we uh, play the guitar, we want to sound like um, like a singer. So classical music um, um, can teach about anything, just about anything. In uh, in relation to flamenco, probably harmony. That that will be a um, great. Um, that will be a great thing to study. Like for example, uh, music of Manuel de Falla. If you want to play Spanish guitar, uh, listen to his music, and his his harmonies are incredible and his melodies and it's all so spanish it's, it's 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 fantastic so i like i like listening to all sorts of composers in in classical you know i really like tchaikovsky for example his symphonies especially the sixth and uh, i love bach i love stravinsky you know i i beethoven obviously you know mozart like all all these um all these composers but also renaissance music and also um, you know some of the 20th century um, things I, I I like and others I I don't you know but even if I don't relate to some of these like um, the 12 tone works for example or atonal music maybe the early early atonal I really like um, I still 
find something to amaze myself with so and uh maybe another style that um I, I i like listening to is jazz and maybe i need to listen even more i mean i, I listen to it a lot but i guess what you can find in jazz is freedom while knowing the theory you know where you are at so you're always aware what the harmonies are but you have this freedom of express expression and it's kind of it's it's so brave you know to be able to just uh, improvise with no preconceived you know well how how do you say that um with no No preconceived building blocks, or how do you say that, really? No, I, I know what you're saying there. Um, it's pure creativity. Pure creativity, exactly. So there's no, um, you are not relying on 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 things that you've, you know, done in the past. I mean, it's not purely like like that, like one hundred percent, of course. Um, but but the expectation is that when when you have a solo it's basically it's in the moment it's being in the moment and uh, not caring so much about how how it comes out like not being afraid to make mistakes because you can hide any mistake um if you have like a red note right so not that you should not have played if you're good enough you can make it fit and you can justify it so that's that's what I find and that is so interesting in jazz and I really respect these musicians are just tremendous. Are there any particular players in the jazz world that really stand out for you in that regard? <laughs> uh, so so many um, actually it's hard to say but you know Miles Davis for example just you know just one one note <laughs> kind of impro improvisations really really interesting um yeah there there are too many musicians really to to choose from um but i did study some jazz when i was um, at the conservatory and that was a wonderful wonderful experience like i've never had that experience in my life um so free there's some wonderful answers there grisha it leads me actually quite nicely to a bit of a follow-up question because you kind of referenced this at the start of your answer and I'd like to tease it out a little bit. Over the years when I've come to you with the guitar and asked questions about specific issues I have, one thing that's often struck me is you will reference other instruments in your answers. You know, you'll often point to a particular sound you can get with a, a choir or an orchestra or another instrument and guide me in thinking about how I'm trying to shape the sound on the guitar through that. And sometimes we'll talk about it in a technical sense, in terms of how we think about a particular hand position or a particular hand movement. And it strikes me that you clearly, although you love guitar music, you also take a lot of pleasure in listening to instruments that aren't the guitar. And with this in mind, other than the guitar, what instruments do you most enjoy listening to? And crucially, how has this influenced the way you've approached the guitar? Well, voice uh, is probably the most influential instrument. Human voice is so natural to us, right? Like that's that's what we have. That's what, that's how we speak. It's related to speech and storytelling. So when you listen to to singing. Um, there's everything that you need to know about expression, about vibrato, about, um, you know, taking a breath, so phrasing, uh, about dynamics, and um, also colors. You know, some some of the most expressive singing sing singers, they can have a variety of, of moods, of e expressions in their, in their singing, so they can sound you know happy or sad or you know almost crying and it's it's it all strikes a chord right 
when you when you listen to to very expressive singer. So I love listening to um, flamenco cante for that expression. So that really influences me a lot, uh, specifically to ornamentation and dynamics and the phrasing. You know how how do they end their their letras? So what is the span of of a melody, and where does it go? How how does it rise and fall? And um, yeah, the ornamentation of it, it's very, very interesting um, and very, very much can be applied to solo guitar. So I really like listening to piano because um, that's the instrument to learn uh, the, the rhythm of, you know, of the melodies, you know, how, how, how to do, uh, what is it? how to make a sound softer, you know, but only through um, exact placement of a note in time. So that's that's a very, very uh, important instrument to listen to also for dynamics. So, and uh, of course I like um, um, all the string in instruments, probably violin uh, and cello would uh, would st send out to me um if you want to learn about vibrato listen to cellists really i mean you can you can get it from a voice but uh, listen to cellists and i also like uh, percussion specifically tabla you know just uh, that's that's an incredible instrument i think and it's worthwhile to learn some something about indian music and the way that um they conceptualize the rhythm so it's not it's not just whatever they want it's all mathematics and uh, that could be applied to flamenco as well i i feel so yeah those are those are the the instruments that i i really enjoy listening to there's some wonderful food for thought there i don't think i'll forgive myself grisha unless i ask the question i'm about to put to you I'm going to come away from the subject of listening a little bit now, and I'd like you to speak directly to those watching and listening with this one. Mm -hmm. I think it's fair to say that many people watching and listening to this, myself included, by the way, find you quite an incredibly inspirational person mm -hmm. to have achieved so much in terms of mastering the guitar generally and flamenco specifically. Like you, I teach a lot, and I often hear students of flamenco say something like this to me. I love flamenco, but I don't come from Spain, and I didn't grow up in Andalusia, so I'll never be able to master it. What would you say to someone who says or thinks that? Well... I say that you probably won't sound like somebody who was born in the under in the Lucia, but you're going to sound like yourself and you should absolutely do that. You should absolutely play flamenco and bring bring something from your culture to it. I mean, flamenco already had so many influences, right? There are just so many of different cultures throughout the world and it keeps growing. So why don't you play flamenco and bring your own culture to it, your own take. And remember, it's not really about um, being born into it. Even Paco de Lucia, he, he, his mother was from from Portugal. So he, he was not even fully Spanish, right? But he was the best of flamenco guitarist. So I say, don't don't worry about that aspect, just Expose yourself to as much flamenco as possible. Start start listening to it every day, all day, and and learn from that. Learn from the best artists. And if you are surrounded by that music from the early age, like I was, you're able. You will be able to do that. And you will probably not uh, play like like a Spanish person, but it's it's going to be uh, your own take, your own interpretation. And, um, really. Um, it will only enrich flamenco. 
if uh, if you are able to do that well and uh, you you should be able to do that well if you love it so go for it 100 percent let the spanish people do what they do best and let them play how they play and uh, you play how you play so there is room for for everybody no, yeah there is enough space even if the whole planet played flamenco there'll still be enough space for some more so that's a wonderful answer, Grisha, and thank you for sharing those words of wisdom with those watching. Well, my friend, I really appreciate you coming on the show and having this discussion with me. We're pretty much at the end now, but before I ask my final question, if people have enjoyed hearing what you have to say here and want to find you online and check out what you're up to, where's the best place to go? Probably YouTube. I used to have more choices. Uh, I used to be on Instagram and Facebook, but I kind of um, became a little bit bored with it. Not even bored, but uh, I have some disagreements. And uh, because of that, I canceled my accounts. But I've been thinking of maybe coming back at some point. But right now, it's YouTube all the way. Uh, and I also have a website grishaguitar.us that's uh, that's where you can you can check out my upcoming performances and all that so hopefully one day i'll come back to social media but i really don't want to spend too much time there i can understand that my friend and to all those watching and listening i can say from personal experience that grisha's youtube channel has some amazing educational content on it so i would highly recommend if you've enjoyed the videos i put out on youtube go and check out grisha's there's some amazing material there mm -hmm. i'd like to conclude grisha with a question i always like to close with hindsight is a wonderful thing if you could go back in time and offer your younger self, the young musician, Grisha Goyrachev, one piece of advice, what would it be? Just one? <laughs> I have so many, so many advices. But I guess if I compare all of them, it would be to compose be to compose early so for me uh, I was a little bit shy and uh, I just couldn't couldn't push myself to to compose because then I would be expressing something of my own and I was too shy to express that only to myself but not not to other people so composing would be a wonderful advice for, for myself but also you know, I, I, I tell you that I practice a lot. I didn't always practice a lot. So if I practiced a lot back back then, I I would have been much better. So I would say, don't waste time, Grisha. <laughs> Just because life is too short, really. And uh, that, that would be another good advice. And also just be patient. I mean, that's, that's very, very important is to be to be patient and to believe in it, to believe in your future. Yeah, because we all get discouraged. So I think patience is, is key. But for me, probably number one would be to compose because I feel that I would have been a different musician than I am now if I started early, really early. And I always wonder, who would I be? So that's that. There's some wonderful inspirational advice to close on. And with that, Grisha Goyrachev, thank you very much for coming on the show and talking music. Thank you, Sam. It's been a pleasure.